everyone. This video is going to go over the PowerPoint on Chapter 6, How Do I Read Short Fiction or Short Stories. So you've already read two short stories um, and we are going to continue to discuss them, but this chapter kind of sets the, the groundwork for uh, what we should expect over the next couple weeks as we look at different elements of short stories. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about structure, we're going to talk about point of view, we're going to talk about setting and atmosphere, imagery and symbolism, theme, and we're going to look at um, some questions that you should continually ask yourself anytime you're reading short fiction. Um, and then in the next handful of PowerPoints over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at each of these things even closer. So the first thing that the chapter kind of introduces to you is to notice the structure of a story. So what we're talking about with structure is not the storyline, not the content, not what it's about, but how the story is laid out for us. How does the plot develop in the short story? Um, and so the plot is, you know, it is the storyline, but it's really about the action that lead up to, you know, the climax. And there's usually a conflict of some sort. And that can be a conflict, um, you know, between the main character or the protagonist and another character. Or it could be the main character is, there's some sort of conflict between that person and um, nature. There could be a conflict between the main character and him or herself. Uh, so, but there's some sort of conflict, some sort of tension that is at the heart of the story. And it's that conflict that, that spurs the story, that spurs the action. And the action usually climbs uh, until we reach the climax. Um, and the climax is sort of it, it doesn't have to be this huge earth-shattering event, but it it is the moment in the story where everything kind of comes to a head. Um, and sometimes it resolves the conflict. Um, sometimes it just ends it. Like, <laughs> there's some sort of catastrophe or tragedy that happens, um, or disaster. But, you know, the climax is where everything converges. Then there's typically a little bit of resolution that happens afterwards, uh, but not always. Some short stories will end, you know, right at the climax, right after the climax, instead of giving us that wrap up afterwards, you know. Um, you know, if, if you think of it in terms of like a movie, <laughs> uh, you know, the conflict, you know, is like the big fight scene, the big battle. And afterwards, we usually get a scene at least, maybe, you know, three months down the road or a year later. And we get to see kind of how the main characters uh, are after they've been through all of the conflict that happened in the story. Short stories will often do that as well, give us that glance, that glimpse of the future, or at least the aftermath. But sometimes they don't. Sometimes once the battle is finished, that's it, that we don't get anything else. Sometimes they'll use flashbacks as they're developing the plot, um, which is, you know, because typically, you know, you think of a story's action as being linear and it progresses. Sometimes they'll stop though and take us back um, and tell us about something that happened in the past. And it's usually to supply some sort of necessary background information um, or sometimes to create suspense. You know, if they stop that forward momentum for a moment and give us a flashback, they're kind of leaving us hanging here and it, it builds that suspense for us. 
Um, a lot of writers play with flashback a lot, and they play with uh, whether or not their story is going to be told in that linear fashion. We kind of expect uh, that the story has a beginning, and it just continues to progress until the end. <laughs> But that's not always the case. Not only do they sometimes use flashbacks, but sometimes they'll go forward in time also. Um, you know, if this is a, a story that's being told about, you know, let's, I'm just going to use this as an example. Let's say we're reading a story and the story itself took place in the year 2010. Right? It is now 2020. And 10 years have passed. So the story happened in this middle part. And while the story is being told, we might flash back to something that happened in the year 2000. And then the story keeps going. And then we might flash forward <laughs> to something that happened in 2015. And, you know, so the story can use flashbacks and flash forwards. Sometimes they'll use all different kinds of techniques and it, it can make the story very fractured and very confusing. Um, if I gave you a movie example, it would have to be Pulp Fiction, if you've ever seen that movie. Um, you know, the storyline is very odd, uh, you know, and you can do that with writing as well. And a lot of postmodern writers have done that, um, played around with our, our expectations of how a story progresses. Um, so it's something to pay attention to, the structure. Uh, another thing to think about, point of view and setting. So the point of view is the position that an author chooses to relate a story, to tell the story. Um, and it can be very crucial to our, to the effectiveness of the story. Um, maybe even, it might even affect how we understand the story, depending on the point of view from which it's told. So there might be, you know, the main character, it might be from his or her point of view. It might be from a secondary character who has observed what happened in the story and is telling us about it. It might be that narrator that just seems to know everything. <laughs> um, so point of view is very important. And a lot of, you know, going back to the structure of a story, and how you can play around with uh, traditional expectations, you can with point of view too. You can you can switch the point of view, um, and and have it be from different characters' perspective throughout the story, and that's really interesting. Um, William Faulkner has a, a book called As I Lay Dying where he does that. It's very interesting um, because the, the 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 time of the story keeps progressing. It's not like we get day one from this person's point of view, day one from another person's point of view. It's day one from this person's point of view, day two from the other person's point of view. So the, the timeline keeps progressing, but the point of view keeps switching back and forth among other characters as it progresses. So thinking about who's telling the story, what their perspective is, uh, can tell us a lot about what we're supposed to get from the story. Okay, we're going to talk more about that. Setting is something to consider. Where is it taking place? time and location um, and some things to think about with setting is could it have taken place at any other time in any other location and still be the same story or does the setting directly affect what is happening in the story so we'll talk more about setting later as well um, obviously we're dealing with fiction and you know stories so we want to look at characters um, look at how a character is characterized. <laughs> um, what do they think about themselves? What do we learn about them? What do other characters think and feel about them? If we get that information. Um, what does, what gets revealed about that character's thoughts? What gets revealed about that character's behavior? Um, so learning about the characters and studying them pretty closely can really tell us a lot about a story as well. Um, there are a lot of specialized literary techniques that get used in short fiction. 
um, there's something called a foil, and that's a like a minor character whose role kind of sharpens our understanding of a major character. And it's usually because there's a contrast. So there's something very different about these two characters. But by studying the minor character, we actually learn a little bit more about this main character because of those differences. Okay. Um, there's irony, right? Uh, irony is an upsetting of expectations. So it's having the opposite happen of what you would think would be the usual thing to happen. All right. Um, irony is one of those really tricky things in literature, though, where you might not realize it's irony until after the fact. Uh, and then looking back, you're like, oh, okay, that was a very ironic moment right there. But you don't realize it in the moment, right? Because you just don't always realize that there has been this contradiction until afterwards. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about irony as we discuss the two short stories in more detail. Um, foreshadowing is used quite a bit in literature. And foreshadowing is when it, it kind of works the same as irony in that you might not know that it was foreshadowing until after the fact. Uh, but foreshadowing is basically just giving a hint of the future, giving a little hint of what is going to happen a little later on. Um, you know, for instance, if there's some really odd attention placed on, let's say, the embers in a campfire, or the, you know, someone smoking a cigarette and the, the cherry at the end, if there's a lot of attention to, you know, how it glows, how red it is, and, you know, that could possibly be foreshadowing some sort of bigger fire that is going to happen later in the story. But you're not going to know that. <laughs> you're not going to know that those embers or the end of that cigarette meant anything until you get to the fire. And then you're like, oh, they were kind of dropping little clues along the way. And that happens quite a bit. That's a very common technique that's used. Um, another uh, literary technique that we're going to spend a lot of time looking at are images. So images are those pictures that get painted in your mind, word pictures as I call them. Motifs uh, are when an image is repeated, you know, deliberately. Uh, that kind of makes us, draws our attention to the fact that those images, that, that repeated image probably means something, it's significant in some way. A symbol, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about symbols too. Um, if a repeated image, it doesn't even really have to be repeated, but if uh, an image gathers significant meaning, all right, uh, that is clearly related to the theme or the central point of the story, uh, then you might be dealing with a symbol. And we'll talk a lot more about those down the road. Um, so we're going to talk about each of those elements in more depth, but this was just sort of an overview of all of the different elements of short stories that we need to learn about and pay attention to to figure out and see how they all work together to reveal a, a bigger, more clear picture of the story itself and what the author was trying to accomplish and what they wanted us as readers to get out of it. So all of those elements work together to do that. Um, they reveal the theme, basically. We're going to talk about theme in more depth as well. So you need to ponder, you need to think about um, all those elements to discover what the theme is. Keep asking questions, you know. Um, and keep, uh, just keep thinking about these things. Go back to it, look at all these different elements, and ask yourself questions 
um, to get to some meaningful observations about the story. The last two slides of the PowerPoint give you um, 11 different questions, critical questions, like critical reading questions, to ask yourself as you are reading the story, rereading it, and then um, just thinking about it after the fact, you know, thinking about characters, the structure, all of those different elements. Keep asking yourself questions about them, and you're going to end up revealing something. You're going to find something out. You're going to figure out what the theme is and what the author wanted us to get out of it. So that is what we're going to be doing over the next couple weeks. If you have any questions about the information in Chapter 6, let me know. But remember, it is just a, an overview, and we're going to get into each of these elements in more depth. Okay? But I am here if you have any questions.